שלום לכם. ניל שובין הוא פרופסור לביולוגיה ולאנטומיה באוניברסיטת שיקגו. צוות שאותו הוביל מצא בשנת 2004 את המאובן תיק תהליק, החוליה החסרה בין דג לבין המאובנים המוקדמים ביותר של חוליתני היבשה. שובין הוא מחשובי חוקרי המאובנים הפעילים כיום. את ספרו, הדג שבתוכנו, הוא פותח במילים הבאות. עונות הקיץ האופייניות לחיי הבוגרים עוברות עליי בשלג ובגשם קפוא מעורב בברד, כשאני מבקע סלעים על מצוקים הרחק מצפון לחוג הארקטי. רוב הזמן אני קופא, סובל מכוויות קור ולא מוצא שום דבר. אבל אם יש לי קצת מזל, אני מוצא עצמות דגים עתיקות. לרוב האנשים, לרוב האנשים זה אולי לא נשמע כמו למצוא מטמון, אבל בשבילי העצמות האלה יקרות מפז. ועכשיו, כשהוא לא זוכה לסלע, בגשם ושלג גפו, נוכל לשאול אותו למה היה לו כל כך חשוב לכתוב על הגילוי שלו לקהל הרחב. וכדי שנשמע את התשובה, אני אעבור עכשיו לאנגלית. שלום ובלקם to פרופסור ניל שובין of the Department of Organismal Biology and Anatomy at the University of Chicago. Neil is not only a paleontologist and evolutionary biologist, but the author of the award-winning book, Your Inner Fish, about the evolutionary history of the human body. Neil, you and your colleagues reported the discovery of the Tiktaalik in one of the top scientific journals, Nature. You have plenty of other notable scientific achievements to your name. Why did you go on to write about your expertise and experiences to the wider audience? Yeah, I think we as scientists have a responsibility to connect a large disconnect in society. We live in an age where many of the decisions we have to make as, as a population are largely scientific, you know, whether it's about human health and disease, agriculture, climate change. I mean, we're living through a pandemic and thinking about viruses and vaccines. So just as an age where we need to address scientific issues and require a populace that's educated in science, we have a disconnect. A lot of people are not familiar with science, its methods and its data, or sometimes are opposed to science. So what I thought is with uh, this discovery, maybe I can connect that disconnect. Maybe there are stories that I can tell that can help people understand the process of science. So these are stories about evolution and evolution is a problematic topic in many parts of the world, including the US and Israel. What does that mean for evolutionary biologists who are also visible scientists? Well, I think we have a power to tell our stories. I mean, stories have a real power to humans. We're a storytelling species. It's the way we remember facts. It's the way we tie them together. It's the way we're entertained. Well, if you can couple all those things and join them uh, to, to educate about science, I think you can do very well. And so what I really felt is we had a very powerful story of discovery, of the discovery of Tiktaalik, of working in the Arctic, of trying and failing and learning from our failures and using science to make predictions and sometimes getting lucky and sometimes getting unlucky and sometimes solving puzzles. It was all these human things, right? So it gave me an opportunity to tell the, the, the way we do science in a very human way, right? And I think what that does is to show this discovery, I can show evidence for evolution, which can be a controversial topic where people can you know, recoil from it, but I can do it in a very friendly way. I can do it in a way that is very human. and in a way that really addresses the evidence for evolution without me ever telling you about it, because I'm telling you a story. So that's what struck me as very powerful with this particular story. Um, and it, it allowed us to, to enter a very controversial field in a very joyful way, mm -hmm. in a way that sort of celebrates human discovery. And I thought that's what we wanted to do. You're also the provost of the Field Museum of Natural History. What is the role of natural history museums for research and for science communication, especially around evolution? Well, I found my love of science in museums. You know, I remember the days my parents or my teachers would take us to, uh, to museums where I was growing up in Philadelphia and New York. And I just fell in love with uh, the, the specimens there, whether it was archaeology or paleontology or mammals or birds. And the thing about being in a museum is one of the questions you get most from people is, is that real, hmm. right? And so you look at a dinosaur bone and they'll say, who's that real? Well, I mean, there's something about that word real that it really it affects people. These, these objects have power that can capture imagination. So having real objects on display to show people that these things are, are real, that real people went and collected them and, and found them and, and how they did that is very powerful. 
The other thing about museums that's, uh, that was challenging for me initially, but I think is very important in the museum experience, is as a scientific communicator in a museum, you're talking to kids, you're talking to teenagers, you're talking to adults, you're talking to PhDs, you're talking to business people, you're talking to people from all walks of life and all ages. So it's a very powerful way to commute science, to, commute, to communicate science to an extremely broad audience. And there's very few venues where you can really do that, talking about and showing real things, which can capture people, capture people's imaginations. That's really interesting the way you put it. So if you find also a way to bring teenagers to science museums, do, do let us know how to do that. <laughs> Well, a lot of them like it because, you know, they're not in class. <laughs> that, was my, <laughs> that was my thing. It was a day to be away, but it was also a day to be away and learn, you know? And I'd always come back by wanting to buy a book or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, wanting to follow up on what I saw in the museum. And I see that today, you know, in the gift shop where people want to buy a book or they want to learn more or they may do internet searches just based on something they saw at the museum. That, that's, that's a really optimistic way to look at it. Um, about the role of science museums, really, within science communication. I have one last question. So together with your colleagues, you won the Communication Award of the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine for excellence in communicating science to the general public. And the Wall Street Journal has called you a natural storytelling and a gifted scientific communicator. How much of this trait is the nature and how much of it is nurture? What, what could you recommend to a scientist who wants to evolve as a science communicator? I think the more you do it in different frameworks, the better you get. So I'm, I'm very much on the nurture side. Um, that is, you know, one of the advantages I had when I wrote that book, Your Inner Fish, is I was talking to kids. I was talking to college students. I was talking to teenagers. I was talking to medical students about the same thing about Tiktaalik and anatomy and so forth. And what that did is that experience of, of, of trying to communicate to different audiences and failing and learning from my failures, I think that experience really helped me a lot to tell my stories and tell, tell other people's stories of science as well. Well, thank you so much, Professor Neil Shubin, for this really inspiring conversation. Thank you.